Welcome to Nurture for the Soul. I am Reverend Dr. Aaron Wade, your host for today's webinar. I serve as a Minister for Congregational Leadership Development, Granting and Scholarships on the Faith Education Innovation Formation Team, often referred to as Faith Info. We are a part of the Justice and Local Church Ministries within the national setting of the United Church of Christ. Nurture for the Soul is a weekly webinar offering sharing practical, educational, and innovative formational resources and engaging critical topics for local churches and people of faith. Produced by the Justice and Local Ministries of the United Church of Christ, we faithfully focus on care and education for the people of God. From cultural and community organizing to congregational leadership, from worship and theology to resourcing small and rural churches, from ministry with youth and children to wide ranging justice issues, featuring guest artists and authors and key leaders. Nurture the soul stays current to how the gospel is alive in this time. This is a space for connection, community and nurture. Together, we can bring our churches, our community and the world towards the world God imagines for us all. Join us every Thursday at 3.30 p.m. Eastern time for Nurture for the Soul and look for special offerings from time to time as well. We are always producing opportunities to engage and you can find a full list of upcoming digital programming offerings at ucc.org backslash events or on any of our social media platforms. Friends, if these conversations move you, if what's offered here helps enhance your ministry or your soul, please consider donating towards the annual fund of the United Church of Christ by simply texting UCC to 41444. Your prayerful and financial support helps programs like this in the essential work of the United Church of Christ. In advance, I wanna say thank you for your contributions. Today, we are on the final episode of a four-part series called Revitalizing Church Practices. And during this series, we have explored, one, new church planning strategies for success, targeting our new churches and those interested in planting new churches. We looked at, secondly, multiple streams of income through 501c3, helping folk to think beyond tithes, offering, and pledges. Thirdly, we've looked at navigating the water of writing effective grant proposals, applying for grants. And today, we will conclude this series with exploring effective grant making, creating granting opportunities that foster impactful change. Each episode features a panel of seasoned experts who shared their wisdom, who will share their wisdom and experience. Continuing in the same way, today we have seasoned panelists who are with us today, and I want you to meet them personally for yourself. We will now have our panelists introduce themselves and speak to their connection to the work that we are about to discuss today. I'm going to ask if Reverend Dr. Gail Holness, Anthony Fox, and Reverend Dr. Bentley Phillips DeBartalavin, if you would please unmute yourself and turn on your camera and please introduce yourselves in that order. Reverend Dr. Gail Holness. Somehow, always have issues with um, uh, with these Zooms and all of these other things. And I think they're important and I think we need to do them. Um, I'm glad to, to be here. I'm the Reverend Dr. E. Gail Anderson Holness, the Faith-Based Outreach Coordinator for the DC Department of Behavioral Health. I have been in this position for seven years. Um, and prior to my coming, there was no faith-based outreach at DBH. So I brought um, a wellspring of knowledge to this uh, position, and I'll just share just a little, just in case no one knows. I'm a graduate of Clark College, which is now Clark Atlanta University, Howard University School of Law, 1981, Howard University School of Divinity, um, 2005, Harvard School of Divinity, uh, with a certificate in Global uh, Ministries and Wesley Seminary with a certificate in Health Ministry. Wesley is here um, in Washington, D.C. I'm a mother and uh, the proudest grandmother on earth mm -hmm. of three grandchildren. I had one child and her, she and her husband have produced three. They want two more and I'm grateful. At any rate, well, that's who I am. Um, and I live in 
Washington, D.C. I live in Ward 1, and I am a walker, so I see the impact of health in our community, um, not because of the work that I do for DBH, but because of the work. And I've got to be honest and say it. I'm unashamedly a Christian. I am a pastor. I am the pastor of Adams Inspirational African Methodist Episcopal Church. I've been pastoring for 25 years. I cannot deny God. And I know as a lawyer, uh, there were some people who will say, uh, Brother Fox, that there's a separation of church and state. Uh, well, Reverend Dr. Bentley, I know you agree with me as well as Reverend Dr. Wade. There is no separation because I believe um, that I read somewhere that the government would be on his shoulders. And if it's on his shoulders, it's on our shoulders. And I carry that weight unashamedly and without worry or regard. And I'm just as bold as I've ever been. And I intend to remain the same way. I'm the youngest of 10 children. So I'm used to having background music and back up. So I'm here to help you become better in what you do for our communities. We are all here, not because of the jobs that we have. And we do have these jobs, but because we're committed, at least I'm committed to do the work for the people. Is that all I needed to say, Dr. Way? That was great. Thank you, Dr. Holders. Thank you. And so how can I follow up behind such uh, a great introduction of oneself? Um, but I will do the best that I can. I am Anthony Fox. I currently serve as the division chief for the community, I'm sorry, listen to me, for capacity building, housing, and community partnerships within the DC Department of Health and our HIV AIDS hepatitis, TB, and SCD administration. Uh, I oversee all our capacity building, our training, uh, especially for organization, new organizations throughout. Uh, I have been doing capacity building work for roughly over 28 years. Uh, been in my current position for 10 years. I, I am a graduate of Jackson State University uh, with my master's in counseling. I am also a licensed graduate professional counselor, um, as well as I as serve as the director of operations for the Community Church of Washington, D.C., which is a UCC church um, here in the Washington, D.C. area. So what I think I could bring to this conversation is centered around how does grassroots movement move into the space of being able to provide the level of services that a lot of grant makers require and that how do we get that, that capacity building, that training, those skills and abilities in a real way. Uh, so I think that's how and what I will uh, bring to this conversation and glad to be a part of this. Thank you so much, Fox. Good afternoon. My name is Bentley debarda Levin Phillips. I am executive associate with Justice and Local Church Ministries. Um, I've been in this role for more than a decade and have served on the national staff for 17 years now. Um, so if we're going to give some background about education and all of that, I am a graduate of Eaton Theological Seminary, where I got my uh, MDiv, as well as Chicago Theological Seminary, where I received my DMIN. Um, with regard to this, uh, my work uh, in the national setting as executive associate, uh, sometimes uh, uh, when I'm introducing myself, I might use the term chief of staff, depending on my audience. I have served at local church um, uh, for uh, 10 years, but that's been quite a while ago. So, yes, Reverend Gale, I certainly respect and understand the position uh, that we are all in. Um, but the work that I do daily as oversee a team and work with all uh, many staff members where I help them in exactly part of the topic here, and that's uh, professional development and our leadership development, because that's that's very important um, for us to know um, what our strengths are, but also how to expand or fill out um, places where we might have a deficit. You don't need to know all things. You just have to have the right team assembled so that you can achieve the goals uh, that you have set before you. Um, I, the last thing I'll say about uh, all of this, 
uh, in my introduction is that um, I've worked with Aaron for I think the last five years or so um, with neighbors in need. Uh, he started off as a volunteer with us and then found his um, uh, happy self onto the team. And so now he's overseeing uh, multiple grant portfolios because he is just that amazing. So I think that's all I need to say in this moment. And I'm uh, honored and excited to be here. Thank you so much, Rev. Reverend Bentley, we appreciate that. Um, I, I appreciate you and I thank you for the work that we've done over the years and look forward to many more years of creating impactful change. One thing I think um, Anthony Fox forgot to mention is that he is a doctoral candidate. Uh, he is at the space of all but dissertation. So I'm going to throw that plug out for you since I don't think you mentioned it. And it may be some useful connections that are gathered here with us today. So today, to start off our panel discussion, I would like to use as an anchor findings from a gathering that took place. This gathering was called the Ecumenical, Ecumenical Grant Impact Gathering. It was a retreat that the Faith Info team hosted in 2018. At that meeting, at that retreat, attendees explored and created key points for funders that could assist in making grant dollars impactful and accessible to those who need it the most. Today, I will share seven of these findings to inform our discussion. Here are some of the recommendations and findings that were suggested that looks to make effective granting possible. The first thing that came out of this gathering was that there needs to be a needs assessment on behalf of the funder. Out of all grant applicants identified, and we know that many folk apply for grants, in many cases, more people than what can be awarded. Uh, the recommendation was that the funders need to identify the most pressing needs within the communities of the grantees that they serve. Uh, and looking at the root causes and highlight those giving extra points or or giving special consideration to those because uh, those are the most needs and identifying those uh, among the group of applicants being very important. The second finding or pearl of wisdom or recommendation that came out of that meeting was whenever possible, unrestricted funding should be provided. This allows grantees to allocate resources where they see fit as it also empowers them to make informed decisions based on their unique insight and their expertise on the ground. So often I know funders wanna have program dollars and project dollars, uh, and those are good, uh, but having unrestricted funding can help the organizations that you're trying to fund reach capacity so that they can be more effective. Third thing that came out of that meeting or third finding uh, was that capacity building grants are important offering grants specifically for capacity building, such as training, technology upgrades, or staff development to help grantees strengthen their organizational capabilities is key. And here at the United Church of Christ, as I mentioned on last week's webinar, we do have an operational support grant that's offered to our churches who've been impacted by uh, the effects of COVID or other crises. The fourth finding, was that there is a need for long-term commitment on behalf of funders to grantees. Consider multi-year funding commitments to provide stability and predictability to grantees, allowing them to plan and execute long-term projects effectively. It's good to get it awarded for a year. That most organizations are grateful, but a one-year funding does not allow for folk to carry out effectively the things that they want to do or be able to hire staff in a meaningful way over multiple years. Having multiple year funding allows for organizations to be able to consider three, five years out and be able to look at sustainability. The fifth thing that came out of this gathering was that a need, is, a need exists for streamlined reporting. In many cases, funders need data. They want to be able to see the impact of exactly uh, where their dollars went and how it impacted the community. The recommendation here was simplify reporting requirements to minimize administrative burden on grantees, especially organizations who already have sm a, a small capacity or, or may not have the capabilities or tools to effectively uh, be able to do extensive data capturing. But simplifying it 
targeting the, the exact approach that's needed uh, will help organizations to be able to grow and be able to move to, to, to grow in sustainability and scale. The sixth learning that was gathered was around risk tolerance. And here it was saying, to, suggesting to founders that they that there's a need to be willing to take calculated risks and so to support innovative projects that may have higher uncertainty, but significant potential for positive change. And last week we talked about uh, a question came up from our audience where how do I convince a funder as a new organization that not only we have the passion, do we have the passion, but we have the ability to serve folk uh, if we are a new organization. So taking that risk on some organizations that seem to be promising and that uh, seem to pre present information enough to show that they can have impact uh, is what's recommended here. And then last but not least, the seventh recommendation was around exit strategies. And this is centered around the relationship that's developed between a funder and a grantee. The recommendation was work with grantees to develop exit strategies that ensure the sustainability of the project beyond funding periods. When you have the dollars, if it's a one-year grant, it's great. But what happens to that work if they're not funded the next year? So helping them to massage and think through, not just as a question on the application, but being able to build that relationship as a grant monitor or the person who's directly involved with the organization, seeking how will you look to sustain this, and then offering recommendations beyond uh, that, that particular grant that they have. So those were the seven findings, the seven key things that came out of this meeting that was held in 2018 by the Faith Info Team of Justice and Local Church Ministries of the United Church of Christ. And with that, I want to get right to our panel, and I want to ask these experts some questions around this, and in particular, questions in the field that they work in, how do we do funding effectively so that we can impact missional work? The first question I want to direct to Reverend Dr. Holness, and I'm going to ask Reverend Holness, drawing from your experience in faith-based grant funding, can you share insight into how grant makers can effectively engage faith-based entities and community partnerships to address complex issues? Please unmute yourself at this time. As a matter of fact, all panelists can come back on the camera, uh, stay muted until we call or unless you're gonna give an answer. So Reverend Holness, can you, can you respond to that for us? Sure, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. Um, the information that you just shared is, is very pertinent information. But one of the things that there are certain criterias that grantees are supposed to have in order to participate in the granting process in DC government. Number one, you've got to be a DC faith-based entity to receive the grants from DBH and for the faith-based grants. You have to be an organization. You don't necessarily have to be a church, but you've got to be faith-based oriented. And, and as I said to some of you, I'm also a lawyer. So, you know, some of you have 501c3s uh, that are faith-based, but they're not churches. They're eligible. And what you need to do is do the research. And a lot of times, if you call me, um, I will give you the information that you need. I, 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 I simply call it, um, and I, I, I'll say it on the website, um, sort of like a little cheat sheet so that you'll know what you need to do. Some people do not know what they need to obtain from DC government in order to participate in DC grants. And so let me turn my phone off. You know, we multitask. So that, that's one of the things I wanna tell you, just be diligent and be timely with the information. That's what's the important thing. You've gotta get certain, um, you've gotta be qualified based on DC standards. And when there are deadlines, don't if there's a five o'clock deadline, don't walk in there at 501 and say, well, I was running late, the traffic was late. If you knew it had to be there at five o'clock, leave at four o'clock if it takes you 20 minutes to get there, just so you can be on time. It shows due diligence. And that's what it's all about, being um, diligent in your application process, completing everything and not leaving anything unturned dot those I's, cross those T's. If they tell you to bring this document, you have that document. Anything that is asked for in the grant process is available to obtain and easily. Sometimes there's a cost 
And sometimes if you call me, we can help with that process as well. I'm not saying I'm a miracle worker because my name doesn't start with a J. It starts with an E, which is Esther. And who knows whether or not I was brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. Thank you so much for that response. I'm going to give you a follow-up question to that. I would like for you to speak specifically to funders, to grant makers in particular, and talk about how so often faith-based entities get overlooked because of folk thinking that, oh, this is around religion. They only do religious stuff. They want to proselytize. They want to get members to come uh, and come to their church to sit in worship. Um, and I think so often a great opportunity is missed where so often faith-based places, churches are safe spaces. They are safe havens and they have a constituency that oftentimes others cannot reach. Is there with your approach, with you coming into DBH uh, and bringing to DBH this whole cadre of constituents that were once possibly overlooked, faith-based entities, like how would you suggest or recommend recommend or, or, or even suggest to funders to, to consider and utilize faith-based entities? I'm to glad you asked that question because even as in this position that I'm in, I've had also had to be an advocate for the churches because in some of these grants, you know, you cannot go to an institution and tell them what you want them to do for $25,000. I am a pastor and I have had to, I mean, as an advocate, I have to inform them you know, I've had to fight for additional monies in these grants because some of our churches collect $25,000 at the first service. So it's not about the money. We are, and, and I'm speaking from a perspective of a church now um, and as a pastor, we are there. We are what you need. And in the past, many of our churches have been the social service agencies. Many of our churches are the ones who paid light bills, who paid for housing, who gave food. We, we are the ones with the food lines. And, and so you can't expect to come to us uh, as a church and tell us, this is what I want you to do. And for this little bit amount of money, and you got to do all this work. It doesn't work like that. And, and so I, I've had, even in my position as an advocate for um, DPHN for the church, and I've, I've been an advocate for more money because it takes money and resources to do this work, to get flyers, to get brochures, to get things that you're going to give to the community that will attract them to come to you. And it's not all ways about food. They cut food out of some of these grants. You can't get food. How do you think you're going to attract people to the church feeds people that what? Look at us. We eat. And 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 it's it's about food, fun, and fellowship and education. But you can't get me in a place without get, you know, my father would say it and you know, in, in, in my humanness, my father would say, it's hard to rip somebody off and give them something back. Think about that for a minute. We're bringing people in to our communions and telling them, this is what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to give you some naloxone because I know you got a problem or you got family members that need this treatment. And I want you to come in here and I want you to get it. You think I'm just going to show up for that? There has to be something that entices me to come. That entices me to come out of my comfort zone, to be a part of a project that you want. And many of our people, and, and, and I say it very honestly, even, and, and this is public. Residents are very skeptical about going to government agencies. And the first thing they'll say is nobody's listening to me. I can't get anybody to respond to me. And I will submit to you that the seven years that I have been, 
I'm in my eighth year now that I've been at DBH. More faith communions have been exposed to DBH than ever before. You know why? Because I served as the president of the Interfaith Conference. I served as the president of the um, Washington National Council of Churches. Just about every organization that did not put women out, I've served in some capacity that did not allow women to be a part of it. And there are still some uh, institutions like that in, in Washington. But I've served, so I know the people. And, 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 and so I have a compassion. As I said, I live in Ward 1. And, and, and I run into people on the street that are doing the work. But there are some people that don't have any clue about the faith community. And I have to tell folk all the time, even some folk that I work with, the faith community is composed of peculiar people. They believe in something they cannot see. We believe in something that we cannot touch, that we cannot hear. But we have something called faith, the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things that we can't see. If we can see it, we're not hoping for it. And so that, what, that is what keeps me here in this capacity because there are other places and other things that I could be doing. But I am here because I believe that when we're on assignment, until your assignment is complete, Dr. Fox, yeah. you're going to be there, yeah. regardless of what anybody says. But we've got to advocate. We've got to advocate for these funders and let them know, yeah, I want to do the work. But you need to let me participate in the process of what you would want me to do. Because if it's like a treatment plan. And I worked at St. Elizabeth's back in the 80s as a patient rights advocate. You cannot do a treatment plan for somebody that doesn't know what the plan is and you doing a plan for them. You can't tell them. I need you to sit over here for three hours. And they say, I'm not, I can't sit for three hours. So you, you got to change that plan. And it's the same thing with the faith community and individuals bringing money. There's a lot of money out there. SAMHSA has a lot of money. Everybody's tapping into SAMHSA. But it needs people, I, I'm, I'm trying to be ginger about it, but when you're working with the community and people who have, special needs, be it mental illness, physical or otherwise, you can't be afraid of them. And you can't get the grants for people that you don't care about and that you're afraid of because it's not going to work. Thank you for that, Rev. Let me say, most of our churches house uh, the folk that individual that funders are looking for. They house or we're reaching out and touching. And so often, those funds are coming out of the church members' pockets or or uh, the tithes and offerings of the church, which takes away from the ability to do operations because, you know, churches does do need money to operate. And so I think it's imperative, just like you said, for funders to open up their mind. Now, maybe there are some restrictions that are in place, like don't proselytize and don't do this or that. But I do think that funders have to consider uh, a linkage that is often overlooked, which is- the Dr. Term. Wade, I'm yeah. going to stop you there. Mm -hmm. Because if you're going to allow this faith institution to accept these, these grants, that to do the work that they you would want them to do or that you've agreed for them to do, you can't tell them mm. how to proselytize in their mm. own churches. Mm. Now, mm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step on that one. Yeah, I, I, I and I'm totally okay. That, because if you are a faith institution and you believe in God, they knew that when they came to you to tell you that this grant was available for a faith institution. You're not proselytizing to everybody else. Mm -hmm. But when you're in there with your church, I'm going to call, if I'm with my church, I don't care who gives me money. They give me money when I'm in need. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't tell me how to spend my money on my people that I know what their needs are. Yeah. I know my communion. You know your communion. 
you know what your people will accept and you know what your people are not going to accept. That's good. Thank you, Rev. So I'm going to go to Fox. You have a particular experience around capacity building. And Anthony Fox, my question to you is, what are particular effective strategies that maybe you can offer around capacity building for faith-based entities? Uh, are there any things that, things that you would say that you could share with us, uh, strategies that have been particularly effective in strengthening the capacity for faith-based entities? Sure. Um, so that kind of work we've been doing, especially at DC Health, for probably the last 20 years, um, I, we, uh, when uh, Mayor Barry was the mayor of the district, his wife created the Effie Berry Training Institute, or the Effie Berry Institute, which was to really help build organizations east of the river to provide community mobilization and community movement, uh, specifically around the HIV epidemic that was going on. And I thought it was an excellent opportunity. So, you know, we provided consultants to organizations. We provided, you know, uh, how do you build your organ nonprofit? We provided small grants. We provided capacity building. We provided training. We did one-on-one -on -one training, not only with the organizations, but even with community members. And I think that framework really works well uh, and has worked well. Um, the, the issue comes in, I think, with some of the latter things that you mentioned in the laundry list of things that came out of your study is how do you keep it sustained? Because that is only supposed to help you get to some point. And so what do you move from there? And I think what ends up happening, we give people the capacity, we give them the framework, but what typically what I have seen over the course of my 28 years is that most organizations do not build their infrastructure sound enough. And so what I would encourage founders to think about is how do we help organizations, churches build their in infrastructure internally to sustain themselves, to continue to write for grants and be able to manage grant effectively. You know, a lot of us are dependent upon volunteers and churches to be the bookkeepers, to be the accountants, to be the church clerks, to be those kinds of things that are just kind of mostly volunteer for some of us, but some of some of the churches can afford to pay for a true accountant, can afford to pay for, you know, a finance department, but there are a lot of them that are not, and especially those that really are tapping into the communities who we are trying to reach. So for me, I think one of the first things I see as a big thing that a funder could do, and that's kind of what we've been trying to build and and go beyond just see, I'm limited because of the framework about which where I work in. So I can't go beyond that. But what I can say to those of you on this call is that you got, you know, state legislators, you got, you got city councils, you got federal representatives, you need to be marching up and saying, hey, we have the people you want to help and impact. We need money to be able to do this, and we need you to not only put the give the money to governments, but help the governments be able to pass it on down to the community level. And I think that that for me is how we build the capacity because most organizations, and I hate to say this, especially our organizations, when you talk about African American or people of color organizations, don't last very long. And the reason why most don't last very long, we don't have the uh the the other resources that are available to us that some other organizations do. You know, we don't have the philanthropies that are donating millions of dollars in endowments to our organizations so that we can kind of live off of the residuals from the endowments. We don't, and those are the kinds of things that we have to help our small organizations, smaller churches begin to think, because I don't think we ever think at that level. We don't think about how do we create in our own churches, you know, endowment processes or, you know, uh, sustainability plans. And that's what gets to the other question. This is how you sustain programs when the government money is gone, is you have to have some kind of form of endowment or some kind of residual from something else that is going to be able to feed back into the programs that are not going to be totally dependent upon tithes and offerings to make those happen. Thank you, Mr. Fox, for that response. I'm going to ask Reverend Dr. Bentley, you know, you're, you have a huge expertise in leadership development. Um, 
Can you elaborate or share with us the importance of leadership training and development for faith-based organizations and how grant programs can support this? Sure. Um, so it's important for us to realize that because we don't know something, it doesn't make us inadequate. And so there's training. And so that's where leadership development comes in. And so um, I uh, have worked with uh, countless folks throughout my career, um, personally, professionally, and all of that, um, and helping folks to recognize that a resource isn't always financial. You know, a resource can be uh, uh, an organization or um, or a class or a skill set that is developed. Um, and it doesn't have to be just you. You know, if you're developing a team, if you're trying to strengthen your church or your organization, you know, re, uh, leadership development is, is key for sustainability, right? As, as we're talking about all these different things. And I'm not sure that in communities of color, we know where to get those things. And so, um, uh, especially when it's uh, on a volunteer level. And so, um, speaking with leaders in the community, you know, you will find out where to find uh, these uh, places to kind of strengthen your own portfolio. Um, in the United Church of Christ, um, we have uh, different uh, grants that we um, uh, have to to help you to uh, strengthen, as, as I'm saying here, uh, Reverend Dr. Aaron can tell you about all the different types of grants, but we have uh, in my particular um, division, Justice and Local Church Ministries, we have Neighbors in Need grants and there's Genesis grants and there are things of that nature um, to help you to expand and grow in the places uh, that you want and need in order to uh, uh, go forth for the long haul, because we don't want to, uh, it's harder for us to support you if you don't have a long-term plan um, because we money is limited and we don't want to um, uh, throw money in a in a, in your air in your in your way and and then you're gone in a year or two. So again, learning about what your needs are and understanding what your capacity is and where your again your shortcomings are to be developed is the best way to move forward. Thank you, Reverend. Let me say this. One of the things that we look for when we're reviewing grants, and I shared this a little bit last week in our conversation, uh, is we definitely don't mind people building into their plan training aspects. If you're looking at the Neighbors in Need grant, hey, we may have to hire a consultant to come in and work with our leadership team around a particular aspect in order for us to execute this particular project. I think many grant founders find that acceptable. Uh, so people can build in pieces into the grants that may be even restricted grants, project-oriented grants. There can be an aspect of training uh, that folk build into it. I would also say specifically, there are grants that exist in the world, but also in the United Church of Christ that look at and intentionally look at capacity building. One of ours is the CASA grant, uh, the CASA grant for new and rebirthing churches. Uh, those grants allow, we also tag along with the funding that we give, coaching. So we connect you with a coach counselor. We partner with you for you to select a certified coach counselor that will walk with the senior leader or the senior person on the project to be able to strategize, think through the smart goals that you have, think through the budgeting that you've done and how to effectively use those dollars in order to be able to impact, have impactful missional work. Um, so I, I want to note that and I want to give a shout out even to the Costa Grant. We just closed the application September 15th, but we do anticipate it opening again next year, June 1st. But that grant looks at both being able to move organizations from a viable vision to sustainability, to scaling them to the up to the place where they are able to get funds from beyond just tithes and offerings uh, to multiple uh, effort to multiple for multiple uh, spaces so that they can really reach a place where they're at a, a great sustainable place. So thank you for that. Uh, bringing that in, uh, Reverend Bentley. We appreciate that a lot. The next question I have is for all of our panelists. <clears throat> In addition to unrestricted funding, so unrestricted funding is funding that is not tied to you doing a program, you specifically having to do something, it's funding that can go to support operational or capacity building. 
What other innovative ways or financial instruments have you come across that effectively empower faith-based grantees to implement impactful projects? So let me, I can start the, the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. So in most, in most governmental grants, whether it's state, local, federal, you're going to have levels of restrictions that are going to be occur. Now, there are capacity building grants that do come out that really center more on the um, organizational structure, organizational building, organizational kinds of things, but they are very far and limited. And so here's another opportunity for something that you can advocate for. Um, but most of our federal government uh, and, and even for the government, DC government, most of our money is coming either directly from a federal government, a federal entity, or it's coming from the local local taxpayers dollars. And even in the local taxpayers dollars, as Dr. Anderson Holmes mentioned earlier, they have so many restrictions that come along with it. You know, you got to do this, you got to have this, we got to see what the impact is going to be, we need to have data collection. But I mean, I come from a small, originally from a very small church, with maybe 10 members where the pastor had to work a full-time job uh, and he, you know, was there every Saturday and Sunday for all birthdays and everything else, but we didn't have, you know, no huge, you know, pool of money that we were worked with. Uh, and so I understand that, but you don't get that uh, with these kinds of grants, especially from a government entity. Now, there are other grants and I don't think we ever think about looking into those. You know, we have foundations that often are looking to support faith-based kind of work. We don't ever look at them, uh, you know, and, and if your goal or your thing as a faith entity, whether it's a church or an organization that is not necessarily a church, but it has emphasis on some of the same priorities of those foundations, they look for grassroots organizations to be able to do this work, but we don't ever tap into those. We always looking for the government and or regional people to be able to do that kind of work, but we gotta move beyond just that and tap into those other resources. And that, that's what I'll throw into that conversation, especially around unrestricted funds. You rarely will ever get any unrestricted funds from a government grant. They're going to be very specific and going to be made very clear about how they can be used. Now, you can get some indirect, which you have a little bit, but it's only typically temp, anywhere from 10% or below that you have a little bit more flexibility with. Fox, what is indirect? You just used the term for folk who have never been funded before, never wrote a grant. What does that mean? Okay. What is that so term? So in, in most federal grants, you are allowed a certain percentage of your grant award to do for overhead, whatever that may look like for you. You could pay for the president. You could pay for the, you know, the person who writes the checks every day. You could pay for space utilization. If it's not directly, directly to the work that you're doing, you can use, that's, that's pretty much where you, what I call more of the, even though it's restricted, it's unrestricted. You kind of get to, it's your admin. And typically it's 10% of your total grant award. Uh, some some in, some uh, grants go lower than that. You know, like if you were getting uh, housing money for me, you can only get 7%. You know, you know, there are others that don't allow you to get 3%. But that's just a percentage of your total award that you can utilize as administrative for however you need to deal with any overhead that may occur within your, in, in, within your projects that you're doing. Is there anyone else that would like to offer wisdom around? And, and let me say this before I, 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 well, let's finish this question. Is there anyone else that would like to offer wisdom around uh, ways that, um, that other than unrestricted funding, ways that uh, financial instruments that they've come across that can effectively empower faith-based grantees to implement impactful projects? All right, it's okay if we don't have anyone else I want to add there. I will say that for those who are watching this program, uh, you can feel free to ask questions. There are questions that you can place in the chat or there's a special question and answer section found at the bottom of your screen. You can click that and put a question there and we'll be able to answer it as panelists or as myself as the moderator uh, for this particular conversation. And I will also say that uh, we have representatives from the District of Columbia government 
they don't speak for all government entities they're speaking specifically for but it's it, it's for you to be able to get a glimpse that there are funds beyond our denomination and other pockets and other places and i want us to creatively think about the fact that we as churches have the ability to be able to go after some of those funds. I want to wake up our consciousness, make us think about it, let us know that there are funds. And as you just heard Mr. Fox say, uh, there are entities, corporations, and foundations that do undergird the work, the missional work that churches are doing. And so I just want to make sure, because I know I talked to a lot of folk and they're like, uh, we, we, we're just not bringing in the money. We're not, we're not, we don't have what it takes. There are ways to be able to bring in other funding. And so they are the district government representative that are here. They're here as a representation of other funding sources beyond the denomination. All right. And so can I add to that too, Aaron? One, yes. Dr. Wade, one mm -hmm. of the other things I say, yeah, um, both Reverend Dr. Holmes, Honest and I are work DC government employees, but beyond DC government employees, I am also a church member of the UCC and I do want to see our churches grow. And so I'm not only speaking, I'm giving you what happens in the government, but I also know that there are other ways by which we can access resources that I don't think we begin to look at. You know, there are always endowments that are out there. You know, a lot of these major families have huge endowments that they want around arts, around, you know, music, around, you know, special studies, around florists. I mean, you anything you could think of that you want to do, there is some type of endowment that has been created by major families because that they're, they're, they're at or foundations that I think we also need to expand our, our reach on getting access to. And that is not including corporate. Corporate does this too. I know a lot of you ask corporate for like, you know, you may go to Walmart, say, hey, we're having a special thing. Can you give us some gift cards? But outside the gift cards, Walmart gives away, you know, a, a billions of dollars to organizations. So there are other ways to also look into beyond just government entities and those that will have a whole lot more restrictions and requirements other than what has been, you know, typically can give you a little bit more freedom to really implement the kinds of programs that you're hoping that you want to do. Very good. Thank you. Could anyone on the panel share an example of successful exit strategies for grant programs that have en endured, that have ensured the sustainability of the projects beyond the grant cycle or the grant period? Uh, do y'all have any examples of it or any recommendations for how to do that effectively in partnership grantees and grantor and partnership being able to do that in an effective way? I can share in that one, um, Dr. Wade. The DBH has been um, issuing grants um, around the opioid crisis. And a lot of the work is getting to the community, educating the community, taking the locks on out to the community, having health fairs, et cetera, and uh, exposing. But education is a major key in most of these grants. And in these grants, in a lot of instances, they will tell you what to do which is why I said we need to get in on the front end to assist them in telling us what to do. Because if they're not in our communities where our, our institutions are, they don't know what the needs are unless they go out and do a needs assessment in every community. And I don't think they do that these grantees do that. They know that there's an opioid problem in Washington, D.C., so they give out money to do the work for opioids, wards one through wards eight. But a lot of times the, the people that are um, issuing these grants have never been to ward one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or eight, or even nine to that for that matter. Um, and so you've just got to be diligent. Um, there were churches who participated in our grants. Uh, they started grants since I've been here in the last, I think, three or four years. And um, some of our churches have, we're doing the work prior to receiving the grants. Let's see, and, and that's a major piece that comes along with these grants as well, because a lot of these faith institutions are already doing the work. They're simply now getting the money to go the resource to go with them obtaining the resources that they need to complete their work. And when the grant is over, they don't stop. They continue. They continue to do the work because they were doing the work prior to receiving the grant. And as I said earlier, I made the comment that 
many of our faith institutions have been the social services departments, the, the social ser service agencies in some of our communities, because many, and, and I'm speaking also as a pastor, because many of our congregants do not feel, I'm, I, I say it again, they're not just going to go see Anthony Fox at DC Health because it's DC Health. If they know Anthony Fox is there, and they know that Anthony Fox has their interest at hand, and he has something to do with this particular grant and can help, they're going to DC Health because of Anthony. And Anthony may not be the face of DC Health, but people feel comfortable enough to go to a Fox because Fox sees them. And I think that's what the major piece is with a lot of our institutions. People need to be seen. And, and, and now we're focusing on a person-oriented um, task uh, with data that is personal oriented, but you've got to deal with a group in order to deal with the person when you're dealing with the congregation. Very good. And these these grants are not individualized for one person. It's generally a general grant to do the work that impacts many people. Very good. Thank I, will you. Dit I will ditto that. I, I think that is so true, and that's kind of where what I have really been. And it's wonderful that we have a new director who feels the same way too. Um, that definitely feels the need for us to be in the community. I have always been in the community, and you're correct. I think the success of why we are been so successful in our administration is because of the fact that we have a public facing we have a public relationship with many of the community members so when they have a question and they need something you're right they're gonna pick up the phone they're gonna call fox and they're gonna ask fox how do i do this or what do i need? fox we need this fox we need that so i agree i think that we have to figure out even for it, it outside of government i'm talking to all funders you right. have to have a public relationship in order to really make impact you can't sit in your office and expect for an entity or even community to feel safe enough to come and get any services that you're offering if you're not in the community and they don't know you. I attend events. I'll show up. Somebody will send me an invitation. I'll go just to show my face to let them know that we are here to support community. And that's what's important. And it is key and success. And that's even to my churches that are out there. You, Even though you may not ever get a person to walk in your door, if you are out in the community and they see you and they see you being a part of it, they're going to have faith that you're going to be there to help them. And when they really need you, they're going to call you. And they may even walk up in your church and say, hey, I remember when I was here on this street corner and I fell out and you were there and you didn't, you came and you made sure I was good. You got me what I needed and I'm, I'm doing well for myself. And I really came back to say thank you. And I thank God for allowing you to be where you were at the time it happened. So I hear you saying be the Jesus, the hands and feet of Jesus in the world beyond the four walls of the church. Amen to that. 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 And I want to say to, to that, Ian um, Fox, it's consistency with the people. You can't go in one time and say, I'm here to give you some naloxone and walk away and think you can go back in a month or two and get respect. It doesn't operate like that. It's about consistency. It's about developing relationships. And I tell people all the time, you can't go to a meeting with these individuals, with these um, congregants and go in and lo go out. You've got to sit there. They've got to see that you are interested in what they do. They don't want you to come in and out on them. They're used to that. They're used to people coming in taking their ideas or using their facilities and moving on and saying, oh, we had an event at, at Pilgrim Rest. Uh, Pilgrim Rest already, already has meetings all the time. Mm -hmm. We've got to be consistent in who we deal with 
particularly when we're dealing with institutions. It, and, and, and so do the funders. The funders can't just go in there and say, we, we have this money, we want to give you some money. But, but even in giving the money, you've got all these criteria, mm -hmm. Dr. Bentley, that you want us to do to take this money. And then if we take the money, and I'm just going to go back to the old common, um, the, the, the old language, if we take the money, you can't own me mm -hmm. because you gave me a few dollars. Mm -hmm. You can't come in here and take over my church. You can't come in here and, and talk to my people without talking to me. And one of the things that people need to understand about the church, particularly the church, the mosque, the, uh, the synagogues, any faith institution. You can't go in that institution and talk to the secretary. Like we do in government agencies, you get to know the secretary, you better know the pastor. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You better know the imam. You better know the 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 uh, rabbi, because nothing in these faith institutions is going to happen unless you go through that head, mm -hmm. and that's the leader of that church. And what a lot of these um, folk don't understand is that you can't go around them. And nine times out of 10, you're going to need somebody that can relate to them. Another pastor, another religious person to go in like I am in this position as a pastor myself. Mm. That's the best thing that, um, and I don't know whether or not they believe it and whether or not any of them are on here, but that's the best thing DBH could have done. Mm. In terms, mm. When you're starting something like this is to have somebody who's connected to the faith community. You can't send Paul in there, and, and they saw Paul last night at the bar. <laughs> I'm just saying, and we're not perfect people. Yeah. And some of us raise a glass and have communion. You know what I'm saying? They, we may have drink, but we may have communion. You understand? Yeah. yeah. So what I hear you saying is that relationships are important on all fronts. Exactly. Funders with grantees, grantees with the constituents they serve. We are people meant to be in community and a part of that is being in relationship. Reverend Bentley, I saw that you had something to say. I want to give you that. Then I'm going to ask a closing question so that we can prepare to close because we're getting close to time. Reverend Bentley, did you have something to say? I want to. It's pretty much been said. I was just going to say that, you know, the phrase politics makes strange bedfellows. Well, the government knows that it needs to work with churches or faith organizations, because as uh, Dr. Uh, Gail has said, as well as Dr. Fox, um, that you know they don't know us and all the things that you've named where we have contact, relationship is important. And so they work with us. And to your point, they don't own us. Um, we certainly in the UCC, especially with uh, Dr. Wade's um, uh, uh, creativity have streamlined our grants in such a way that you don't have to jump through a lot of hoops uh, for five thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars and all of that because it's just not worth your time. So I'll stop there so that you can ask your final question. Thank I'm just going to add this, um, Dr. Bentley. Uh, several churches have given will not participate in would not participate in the second part of grants because of the ask. Mm. You ask too much mm. work for somebody to do for this small amount of money. Mm. You got to give them something in order to get something. Wow, you all are amazing. Thank you for this ex this expertise and this wisdom. So here's my final question to you all as we prepare to wrap up. What pearl of wisdom can you leave? Now, it ain't on the script, so don't be looking at the paper. It's not there. What pearl of wisdom can you leave to folk who are funding individuals, funding entities that are present, that are listening, that will watch this later? What pearl of wisdom will you say as a key point that they might want to consider as they think about their funding that they're making to grantees, the impact that they want to see happen? Is there any word that you would like to say? Sure. So uh, I will go back to what I think I originally said. One is we have to make sure that the infrastructure is in place for sustainability. The second thing I will say is it is about relationships and, and a continuity of continuous relationship building 
throughout the process that will sustain organizations. Definitely. Here, what I would add to uh, this question or the uh, is don't let fear, false evidence appearing real, be the thing that keeps you from moving forward. We know people who know people, even if I don't know people, right? And so speaking with your pastor, speaking with other members, if you're on a board um, and, and all these types of things, other colleagues who can help you get the training to find the resources so that you can move forward and be sustainable into the future. So don't let fear uh, be the thing that holds you back. Thank you. You have to um, yeah, there we go. It's um, the last three things, and it's for everyone. Education, consistency, and relationships. Either the entity that is giving the grants need to send somebody out to the places where they're receiving the grants instead of being cold. COVID is going to be here. It is here. We are still having webinars. We are virtual and hybrid. But, you know, James Brown said, you got to get up off of that thing. And you got to <laughs> get up and you got to go somewhere. You've got to move. And so the education is important, the consistency and the relationships, those three things. And it, 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 it will deal with that infrastructure. It will That will deal with the sustainability. All of those are integral parts of each other. And I know it's 4.30 and I could go on forever because you know, when you're a lawyer and a pastor. <laughs> was near Thank you. Home. Thank you for your insight, though. That was really good insight. Uh, Kim, in the chat, you uh, we, you asked a question about what kind of entity. Do you need to set up a separate entity or can churches go after, go after Fox? Thank you for answering that. Kim, I want to encourage you to check out last week's uh, webinar. Go back. It's on the on the YouTube page. Uh, and we talk about setting up a 501c3, how to do it, uh, when it's important, um, and how it can create more sustainability for the church and for your organization. So please check that out as well, in addition to the response that Fox gave you. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, panel members. I appreciate you all so much. Uh, and this is all the time we have for today's discussion. I hope that this discussion has provided you with useful information around strategies for effective grant making, as well as how to approach funders around granting. Once again, thank you to our panelists for today's webinar, Anthony Fox, Reverend Dr. Gale, and Reverend Dr. Bentley, thank you all for taking of your time and sacrificing to offer your wisdom to the larger community. As always, we are grateful for everyone's presence, your gifts and your questions. Thank you for being with us today and all along the way. Join us every Thursday at 3.30 Eastern time for Nurture the Soul and look for special offerings from time to time as well. Again, we are always producing opportunities to engage you and can, you can find a full list of those digital programmings at ucc.org backslash events or on any of our social media platforms. And if you missed it at the beginning of this webinar, please consider donating to the annual fund of the United Church of Christ by simply texting UCC to 41444. Your prayerful and financial support helps programs like this in the essential work of the United Church of Christ. And I wanna once again, thank you in advance for considering making an offering. Let's close out in a brief word of prayer. Most divine, we thank you for this time to so be able to sit at the table where wisdom is shared, where pearls of wisdom are given and pearls of wisdom are received. We ask that something that was said in this space would touch funders, move on funders' hearts to reconsider how they approach funding so that they can reach those that are often left out. And Lord, we also ask for those who are seeking grant funding, those who are trying to move to sustainable models to do the work in the world of justice that you've called them to, missional work. We ask that you give them wisdom and something in this webinar that was said will give them a new insight, a new approach, or turn on a light bulb for how they can go about moving and shifting resources so that missional work can happen. I thank you for all of our presenters, our panelists, and I thank you for everyone who works behind the scene. I'm asking that you would bless what we're doing in your name, bless what we're doing for the larger whole, bless what we're doing for to bring about a just world for all. We thank you and we bless you. It's in the name of the one who set the captives free. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Dr. Wade, can I make one quick announcement? I know we're overdue. 
my office, I conduct training for churches on the myths and facts of behavioral health. Please contact me. I put my information in there. I'll come to you and we'll, we'll do the um, training. It's called education. Thank you, Dr. Wade. Thank you, Dr. Hope. Siblings in Christ, if you are moved by this conversation, if what's been offered here has helped enhance your ministry or has nurtured your soul for the journey, please consider donating to the annual fund of the United Church of Christ by texting UCC to 41444. Your support will help to provide programs like this, which are an essential part of our ministries in the United Church of Christ. Thank you for your support. Be blessed on your journey and know that you are not alone. We are holding you in prayer. Amen.